This is California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We're in Sacramento today, and we are joined by Tom Torlakson. He's the superintendent of public instruction for our state. He is running for re-election. That election will be held in November. Sir, I've had the honor of traveling recently for work to Central and Eastern Europe. And it doesn't matter where I go. If I have a question, I speak in English, and I get a response back. If I'm at Universal Studios or Disneyland or somewhere in Los Angeles mm -hmm. or San Francisco and someone speaks in a foreign language to an American, no, no can help. It's just not, we're, we're not there. It's embarrassing, kind of. Well, what's going on? Yeah, it's not right, and our students need to be prepared to live and work and thrive in a global economy. So knowing two languages, the rest of the world, as you say, Europe and modern countries throughout Asia. Everyone speaks two languages, if not three. Yeah, if not three. So we want to do everything we can to encourage students to take courses and learn two languages, or three, and have created a seal of biliteracy, which we put on high school diplomas, to honor students who've taken the time to learn that second language. Let me ask you, though, I'm not pretending I'm the best parent, but I have made a decision with my wife that we are going to raise our children to speak Spanish. We're not of Latino mm -hmm. descent, but we just feel as mm -hmm. if it's important. We have a teacher come to the home, and that's our thing. Our friends look at us like we're crazy. Like, what are you doing? You know, wh mm. Why do you need to do this? My point in telling you that is it just doesn't seem to be kind of a, a zeitgeist you know, within the culture of the desire to have our kids learn a second language. How do we change that? How do we get Californians and Americans to realize the dramatic benefits of bilingualism? And it is, again, huge benefits, huge dividends to just knowing not only the language, but a people, their culture, right. their way of thinking, so that we can work with them in the global economy and in inter international relations. So I think part of it is having these programs like the Seal of Biliteracy. We mm -hmm. started with 10,000 students who mm. earned that honor two years ago. Now it's 24,000. I'm running into parents up and down the state that want their students like you, Brad. Amen. They want their students to be proficient in two languages. And they enroll their students in, uh, you know, dual immersion classes. Uh, that is dual immersion is getting to be pretty popular. popular. Yeah, that that's yeah. a great program. I wish my daughters yeah. could have done it. We didn't get in. Whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, do you see those expanding? Absolutely. I see a, an appetite for that, and parents seeing that their students to fit into the global economy and be competitive in the job market must learn two and, languages. And I have to tell you, I'm trying to learn Spanish now. I spoke mm -hmm. French. It's so-so. Mm -hmm. It's tough learning a language in your 40s. It yeah. is just not easy. It's so much easier to yeah. learn as a child in your teens. The benefits are so dramatic and the ease with which it is to learn that language. Tell us more about the program. How does a high school graduate get that seal of biliteracy? They need to take a course sequence in okay. the language. They need to pass a proficiency test. So there's a certain standard that tests whether you truly are proficient in reading, in writing, uh, in you know speaking sure. uh, in the, that language, maybe even dreaming in that language. But the idea is... That's when I knew I was speaking French well, right. was when, when I started, started dreaming. dreaming. Yeah, it's, right. it's not so much anymore. Yeah. Um, at the same time, obviously, I think it's a benefit for Californians to speak Spanish. But still, when you go to a local high school, you'll see Spanish and French maybe German, maybe Chinese, maybe Japanese. It seems like, seems like we're still kind of in this 20th century Spanish and French. You know, look, look we love right. our French, but right. where can we speak French on the continent other than Montreal and maybe right. Louisiana? You know, what about Chinese, Japanese, Korean? Well, I think there again is a, a trend in the right direction to parents wanting their students to be proficient in English and a, a language from Asia. Uh, and I've been visited some of the uh, schools that are teaching Chinese and those students are thriving. They're also looking at opportunities to travel, do exchange, sure. exchanges with students in Even China. Even Arabic. I mean, yes. so many Farsi. languages, yes. far, whatever it is. Okay, for our viewers on HLN, thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back with the superintendent. Sir, I want to speak with you about a report that you spearheaded uh, with the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. That report is called Revitalizing K-12 Civic Learning in California, a Blueprint for action. Talk to us about the genesis of this report and how it finally was issued. Well, the genesis comes from a worry that civics has been squeezed out of the curriculum. It hasn't had the emphasis that it deserves to have. And now we have an opportunity with Common Core and integrating mm -hmm. all learning, science and history and culture and math to the real world, to jobs and experiences in the real world. And we, we want our students to be active participants in our democracy and look at the turnout. The election turnouts have been very low. Uh, we want to instill in our students a sense of 
their rights and responsibilities and the power they have, if they are informed, they have power to change things, to make the world better, their neighborhood, their community. So do give us a sense, what exactly does civics mean? C civics means <laughs> understanding the levers of government, the how you can make right. change. If it's in a school area, you have a, an elected school board member, usually right. five. Uh, right. Usually a city, it's an elected city council, usually five, with right. one, one of them being the mayor. So the idea is, where do you go to solve certain problems or make change, and how do you get informed accurately what a candidate says and what a candidate will do, uh, what issues are. We have a complicated direct democracy system in California with these initiatives. You, you just can't sit down really and read no. the, the title and understand what that measure is going to do. So our goal is to have students be thinkers. This is part of the critical thinking that goes with Common right. Core. But it seems like, I, I think about my daughters, forgive me, it's just that's mm -hmm. my anecdote, right, right. that they had a couple mock elections, and that was fine when they were in elementary school. They're now f entering fifth, entering seventh. But it doesn't, f I feel like they end hit government around seventh, sixth, seventh. I, I don't feel like they get much of government before that. They get the states in right. fifth, maybe. Am I right? Well, what we see where it's working best, and the good examples right. are sort of hands-on projects where uh, students mm. may want to reduce energy usage, and they do a oh, project, and they go lobby the city council or the school board to get... Uh, solar uh, power equipment into that school. I actually uh, recently interviewed a bunch of students from the Windward School where my daughter will be going right. in seventh grade and they carried a bill with Assemblyman Ian Calderon that would right. have, uh, I don't know, it, it dealt with plumped chickens and the plumping process. Unfortunately it died in a probes, but that's another conversation. But they got to testify in yes. Sacramento yes. before the Education Committee. Yes. That's huge. Yes. And seeing young yeah. people go to a city council meeting or a school board meeting or the county board of supervisors, they learn from that experience. And it also gives them poise and leadership skills. I participated. There's Model UN mock elections. I did I, Model UN in did college, you? though, not in high school. But it Te was meaningful, it, wasn't it? Extremely. Yeah. Tell us about what happened when you were a kid. Was it in Daly City? Daly City. I want to yeah. hear what happened. Yeah. How old were you? I was uh, 17. 17, so 17. senior. You were senior? Yep, senior. So what and, happened and to a young Tom Torlakson at the age of 17? A service club, the Qantas Club, put right. on a youth in government, and I became the mayor of the city of Daly City for a you know two-week period. We had our own agenda, but I was able to job shadow the real mayor, who happened to be a coach at our high school. Oh, West, oh that worked West out well. High. Right, right. And so I just learned a lot from this uh, this gentleman who'd been serving for like 30 years as mayor, and uh, just he had poise and he had compassion and he listened. And I became convinced I could make a difference. That's one of the things we want our students to understand. I, they can make a difference. I have a strange memory. I was that kid who loved government. Uh -huh. And I remember when I was in maybe third or fourth grade, I went to the A library and I mm -hmm. said, do you have a book on the Speaker of the House? I was that kid. Uh -huh. And she thought it was like a, um, a, a horror novel <laughs> or something. Now, look, I understand. Who knows who that librarian right. was? But there is that kind of a lack of mm. involvement, engagement, understanding. I mean, the librarian should have known what the Speaker of the House was. Right. Right. You know, but she didn't. Right. You know, right. God bless her. It's many right. years ago. Because, and what you're looking to is to kind of create a framework whereby the whole right. educational community is feeling engaged. Exactly. And, and it will take some mm -hmm. professional development, some training of teachers to, to bring it back and to make it relevant and current. But many teachers have, go look at the news on TV or right. on uh, Facebook, uh, check it out on the internet, and then come into class and let's have a discussion but of current events. With LCFF giving more discretion to districts, mm -hmm. but yet Common Core creating standards, you're kind of in a, it's, it's an interesting time to, to inject this into the yes. conversation. How do you inject it in such a way that you incentivize schools to adopt? Again, I think we put it out there of the value and the importance of it. Uh, we are going to have our task force members fanning out across the state to encourage superintendents sure. and school boards to make this a priority and to uh, use the opportunity, again, to connect learning in the classroom to the real world. He is Tom Torlakson. He was mayor of Daly City for one week in 19, I don't know what. He is now superintendent of public instruction in California. I'm Brian Palmer. It's, it's California edition. For the 2013-14 school year, how many students were deemed eligible to receive California's seal of biliteracy? 14,579, 20,425, 24,513, or 30,338. In 2013-14, 24,513 students were eligible to be awarded California's seal of biliteracy. 
Welcome, it's California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer, and it's coming to you from Sacramento, the state's capital, and we are joined by Marty Block. He is a member of the California State Senate. And, sir, I think it's fair to say that you're on the verge of passing some really groundbreaking legislation, or having one of your bills passed, which are groundbreaking. And that deals with community colleges and the degrees that they are able to offer. Currently in California, community colleges can offer associate's degrees or certificates. What are you looking to see happen? Yeah, if my bill passes, it will be the first time in California that community colleges can actually offer a four-year degree, a bachelor's degree, particularly in technical areas. What's interesting is, at first I would think, well, that's not the mission. But then I realized to over 20 other states have been offering this opportunity. So, you know, talk to us about the genesis of this. How did this happen in other states, and how did it finally come to California? Well, first of all, it truly is the mission. The mission of community colleges have long, has long been to prepare students for the workforce. Mm -hmm. What's changed is not the mission of community colleges, but industry expectation. What industry used to require as two-year degrees to prepare for the workforce, now with the information age, with technological requirements for so many jobs, that same position now requires a four-year degree. So community colleges still do basically the same mission. They perform right. the same mission, but it requires a four-year degree. And in other states, they found the same thing, that what used to be a two-year degree now is a four-year degree, and 22 other states have already moved in that direction. California. Uh, frankly, is behind we're, the curve. We're lagging. I mean, yeah. usually California is setting the pace. What took so long? Well, we have a master plan in California that has served us very well. It was conceived in 1960, uh, so it's 55 years old almost. Mm -hmm. And like any 55-year-old, it needs some fine-tuning. And uh, while it was great in 1960 and served us for many years, uh, as we've seen with, again, this information explosion, uh, really being on top of uh, certain career paths just requires more training, more time in the classroom. At the same time, this is the third effort of yours to get this bill passed. It didn't make it the last two times. Why is it that it seems that we are on the verge? I mean, anything could happen, but it seems like it's going to happen. Why is third time the charm? Yeah. Well, well, I've tried this multiple times because right. I served as president of San Diego's Community College right. District Board of Trustees, and, and it was clear to me that community colleges had the capacity to do this. When I first tried the bill, the first two times I tried, the state was in a huge recession, part right. of the worldwide recession. And while this isn't a very expensive bill, it does cost something. And but, we just didn't have the dollars to spend. But does it, though? I mean, it seems like it would be more affordable. The state would save money because it's more expensive to educate a student at the CSU or UC and less at the community college. Am Absolutely. I missing something? No, no, not at all. It's yeah. less expensive for the students. And for the state, the degree would cost only about half of what a uh, right. CSU degree costs. But there are startup costs to get things going, equipment that needs to be purchased by community colleges. Okay. Um, and thing, we're in such dire straits, and sometimes it's hard to remember, but a few years ago, we were cutting uh, programs by a third or half right. in some cases. So any proposal for a new program was rejected. I mean, community colleges lost a billion dollars during right. the downturn. Right. Now, that started, some of that is being restored. So before we talk about the particulars of the bill, how has the response been? I mean, I got to think some folks are ruffled by it, some are excited by it. How have you been able to push this through? Yeah, overwhelmingly positive mm. response. Uh, three sectors in particular. The, the education sector, the community colleges are very excited sure. about this. Um, the UC, frankly, is fine with it. The CSU at first had some concerns about duplicating programs that they offer. And we'll talk and, about and that. And we've decided not to go mm -hmm. that route. Um, in the business sector, chambers of commerce mm -hmm. up and down the state are supportive because it prepares students for the workforce. Uh, the military. Um, we didn't at first think of our veterans, but veterans are the ones who often need this civilian technical training to use the expertise they acquired in the military back, to get a job. Let's talk more about the particulars. For our yeah. viewers on HLN, thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back with Senator Marty Block. So, Senator, let's talk about the particulars because they are important to understand. You mentioned duplication. Under the bill, the bill that looks like will be marching forward, there can be no duplication between a major offered at a CSU and or UC and a community college. I've spoken with several trustees of community colleges. That gives them a little heartburn. They feel as if nursing as an example. You know, when you look at the Inland Empire, let's say, there's a dearth of nurses. Um, RCC, Riverside Community Colleges, has a great nursing program. There's a new UCR medical school, so they'd like to be able to offer nursing. As I understand it, though, as we talk today, it doesn't look like that will be possible. 
Talk to me about that process and what the rationale was. Yeah, first of all, I agree with those proponents of offering degrees, as long as they're not offered locally by the CSU. Right, that's the key. Uh, but, but having said that, yes. political realities are such that there was concern by the CSU and some other groups that if there was any duplication at all, um, this could harm um, some CSU campuses that have lower enrollments. Um, that is, do any CSU campuses have, I mean, lower well, enrollments? Some, we're some do. No, really? Yeah, some do. In, okay. in San Diego, where I am, it's, Not, no. it's jammed. Right. But in Bakersfield and other places, that, there is room. Um, Frankly, down the road, there may be changes in this policy. It's important that those trustees or chancellors remember that this is a pilot program and that we're taking a baby step here. And we will expand on the pilot, I'm sure, once we get down the road on it. So let's talk about the particulars of the pilot. Initially, as I understand it, the goal was to allow 112 campuses. But like you said, a pilot means let's scale back a bit. So right now, the proposal allows 15 campuses from 15 different districts. So, for example, uh, San Diego has several campuses within the, the system, but only one of those campuses. That's correct. So how did we get to that 15 number? N no criticism intended, but just wondering. No, again, yeah. it's part of the bill amendment process. We started out without a limit um, as we went through the um, Education Committee in the Senate, the consultants and the chair were a little concerned about just willy-nilly letting every campus do this. They wanted to make sure we selected the best campuses for a pilot program, campuses that were already doing very well in, in what they already do. Uh, so the state chancellor is going to be the one to decide which 15 campuses yeah. get to do Yeah, it. let's talk about that process. Do we know how that will work, or is that... The bill gets signed and then it's a regulation that gets passed in terms of applications? Yeah, we didn't want to micromanage too much what that process is going to look like. Um, but we, we're confident that there will be a lot of competition for these 15 no slots. Doubt. What's remarkable to me is this could happen, I mean, January 1st, 2015. We're months away. This, yeah. this is ready to go. Yeah, if the governor signs the bill and it, it has to make it through the legislature and right. it's almost there, right. the governor signs it in September, um, January 1st, schools will start ramping up. In fact, some schools already have an anticipation of it being signed. Probably looking at, we're looking at September of 2015 right. is really the startup. What about the cost to the student? We mentioned it a bit, but I, I would presume one of the benefits, intended benefits of this bill is the cost would be cheaper to the students vis-a-vis -vis CSU and UC. Now, that may cause them some heartache because then they have you know price competition, but where do we go on the cost issue? Well, well the governor has said that he'd really like to see a $10,000 bachelor's degree, and I think this bill will let oh. us get there where the entire four years or however many years it takes yeah. students to complete 120 units can be done for about $10,000 in terms of tuition and fees. So that would be about $2,500 a year, right. and right now at CSU it's about six. Yeah, it, it's about between half and a third of what it costs at the CSU, so it's significantly less expensive. Plus, the other savings, when students can get their four-year degree at the local community college, they don't have to move out of their house even right. if, if they are living with parents or if they have their own family. It really saves money for that reason, too. What about accreditation? How would that work? Because many colleges have their own accreditation issues. You know, Cuesta had some issues and some mm -hmm. others. So how, how will that work? Yeah. As long as it's just one degree per college, and this is part of the reason we started with just one degree, the community college accrediting agency that currently does the accrediting can continue to do it. Once uh -huh. they move to multiple degrees, then um, uh, WASC has to come in and do accreditation. So there'll be some changes along the way. Will there need to be a quick accreditation for this one degree or there, will the current accreditation cover? Yeah, uh, we're, we're hoping and we think we're going to get there right. that the current accreditation will certainly cover the students in the program. The first two years of every program are still going to be the traditional community of college course. classes. Um, and then by time students through the program get to the second two years, we'll hopefully have accreditation in place for them. How do you feel? I feel real good. I think this is going to happen, and it's going to be really a game changer for California. It's very exciting. His name is Marty Block. He is a member of the California State Senate, representing significant portions of San Diego County. My name is Brad Pomerantz, and this is California Edition. California Community Colleges educate what percentage of the state's nurses? 25, 45, 60, or 70 percent? California Community Colleges educate 70% of California's nurses. It's California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. It's coming to you from Sacramento. We are joined by Lorena Gonzalez. She is a member of the California State Assembly. 
I'd like to speak with you about fundraising. We know that fundraising has been in the news a lot lately as a result of from some scandals in the Senate, not right. the Assembly. Not the Assembly. Not the Assembly. <laughs> and there's one issue, I was not aware of it, and that is when an administrator in a district is raising money for the school board members right. of that very same district. There were some challenges in your community. There were. Well, first of all, you have to understand the way um, school and community college districts um, basically are even governed. Right. We call it kind of the Wild West. There are no rules governing. So where we have you know, limits of how much can be raised and, and how much can be um, given from any one source, right. in, in the school districts and community college districts, for the most part, there are no rules. Um, so really? a single donor could give and, and has given, you know, 15,000, 18,000, 30,000. I mean, that could be enough for unlimited, the race. Right. From one donor. And what we had going on in San Diego is, of course, the school board gets together and decides who the top administrator is, who the superintendent is, for example. Um, and that person has um, a lot of power. It's un unlike the assembly where this is a full-time job right. and we're checking everything out. You know, school boards and, and community college districts really are part-time gigs. They are. And they rely on that one person to make a lot of the decisions. They let out a lot of the contracts. They make a lot of the decisions about vendors. Um, you know, they're, they're really that point person and the one communicating with the board as well. It's as if it's the city manager exactly. of the city where there's a part-time city council. Exactly. And so um, they wield a lot of power. And what we had going on in San Diego is in, in three different um, right. districts. So it was interesting. Two, uh, one high school district, one regular school district, and one community college district <laughs> is those administrators were acting as kind of the point person or the money man in getting um, money for the board members. I mean, let's talk about some of these cases at Southwestern Community College. There is a guilty plea. So, I mean, it's yeah. very clear what happened here. Nicholas Eliota hosted a wine and cheese fundraiser at his home for two college board members. Mm -hmm. And who did he invite? Uh, Multi-million dollar contractors uh, to the district. Yes. And he wound up pleading guilty to be an accessory to a crime for right. a pay to play. Right. I mean, it, it, what happens is, you know, we're going through a process where there were all these bonds and so there were construction contracts. And so the people who want the contracts are being hit up by the person deciding who gets the contract for money. And we're not talking, you know, come to a $100 fundraiser. Right. We're talking there were phone calls being made for $15,000. That's so a lot of money. So we want you to give this board member, and what the um, superintendent was saying, if you want me to keep my job and keep taking care of you, then you need to help me get these folks elected. But this is bona fide pay to play. It's so clear. It, you know, in, in unfortunately in South San Diego, there were 17 indictments. Um, and now I think we've just finally gotten through all of them. Uh, most of them were guilty pleas mm -hmm. uh, it, to different levels. We have one school district now that there is one lone board member standing because the other four, yeah, had to like resign. Almost. It, it's yeah. almost as yeah. bad. I mean, they're, they're right. varying degrees. But, um, and now the county had to take over that school district board. What's it called, you know? Um, Sweetwater. Sweetwater, okay, yeah. I mean, uh, you and, know, so uh, we, we've, had, we've had that situation in one. We have another board that's kind of teetering on state control because San Ysidro, San Ysidro of course. Right, I mean, with, with Sweetwater, you have this $20,000 contribution for a board member mm -hmm. working for, from a contractor on a $644 million voter-approved school bond project. Right, and it was just, mm -hmm. you know, obviously, even um, some of the stuff that happened, you know, it just looked and smelled bad, but right. it wasn't necessarily illegal. So they do have, right. um, a, our DA was very aggressive, right. and some people thought, it's you know. the Sweetwater case, there was a non-guilty plea, so we're waiting. Right. When we come back, uh, Lorena Gonzalez, I want to speak with you about a bill that you are pushing that will address this issue. For our viewers on HLN, thanks for joining us. For other viewers, we'll be right back with Lorena Gonzalez. So let's talk about your bill. It's AB 1431. Mm -hmm. What was remarkable to me, you mentioned this to me before we started, when you were in committee, your colleagues would say, that happened in my district, right. that happened in my community. Tell us about that. Every um, committee I was in front of, there would be somebody, uh, another legislator, who right. said, I'm so glad you're doing this. So what the bill does is said, just qu quite frankly, if you're that administrator, if you're the top administrator or one of um, the top administrators so hired by the board, for the example. deputy superintendent, mm -hmm. the superintendent, 
not down to like principles and, and things, but the, the very top level, um, you're not able to raise money for the school board. Um, that's it. You can give it yourself if you want to. Well, that's interesting. You know, because that's a First Amendment right. You can participate. You can go walk precincts, but you can't be the going to other individuals to raise money but could for one the school board. Argue. I understand you can only bite off as much as you can. Yes. <laughs> and so I'm not trying to suggest. One could that. argue that they shouldn't be giving money right. either. <laughs> but I mean, is this was yes. kind of the compromise solution it was we we started off trying to look in fact at the hatch act which is a federal law that okay. that kind of keeps um, right. federal employees out of politics right. and uh and there was just some pushback so we said okay let's make this very clear right. just don't allow them to to go to contractors to anybody to unions to anyone and say you need to give money to this school board member so raising money for the school board members what about if i may ask mm -hmm. if there's a bond for right. example a school bond right. for construction or whatever it is they can still raise money for a school bond and that's more of a communal you know we all I think right. I, having been involved in trying to raise money for a school bond, it's usually the administrator. You're talking about contractors, right. um, interest groups who you know I want understand. that to happen. Parents groups, the PTA is usually involved. The right. school board. I mean, almost everybody to get a school bond passed often has to participate. And we're, we're not touching that yet. There's some other problems with school bonds. We're going to look at next year, probably. Right. So how has the response been? I mean, I know, like you said, there was a compromise, but yeah. was there a little pushback here? You know, there was um, in the assembly. It was interesting for some reason um most although not all i think um uh the the republican analysis was not favorable um they huh. wanted it i think to uh I, i'm not sure yeah. what the argument was and for some reason sometimes they just aren't but a number right. of republicans did vote for it um i in think the in the end because right. they just said look um that this is a problem especially the ones all i think almost all of them from san diego voted right. for because they've seen what's of going course. on um, we also have a problem in L.A., um, Sentinella School District. You know, there is a superintendent who is making, I think, <laughs> I, I can't even remember the yeah, amount of money. Like and it, yeah. it had to do yeah. with um, kind of a similar thing. I think he was keeping the board members in place. And so they were rewarding him with a huge, a huge contract. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like a school district with four or seven right. schools. Right. It was pathetically right. small. Um, so... I, I think once people started thinking about why this made sense, it did. And now that it's over in the Senate, um, my co my co author and, and the person who has right. been very helpful in the Senate is Joel Anderson, a oh. Republican oh, from San so, Diego. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we're 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 happy. It's a two thirds vote, so it's important that I get it, some of that Republican it, why support. Two thirds. Anytime you change the Fair um, Political Practice Act, oh, really? basically you have to, it's a two-thirds vote. So when you start dealing with, with kind of these reform bills on, right. on politics, you need to get a... a now, it's out of the assembly? It is. Okay. It so is. So do you have a sense where the governor is? You know, um, I don't. We met with his staff about it. They they didn't have a whole lot of questions. Right. So I, I think he, he usually looks favorable at these reform bills. There's a lot coming through right now, right? right. So they're going to have to take them all and look at them, obviously, what happened in the Senate has has really sure. pushed all of these different reforms at the state level. Right. But this has been an ongoing problem at the local level for years. Like we said, um, you know, Assemblymember Henry Perea brought up there was some similar problem in Fresno. So, mm. you know, we have the LA example, we have a right. Fresno example, we have three in my district, unfortunately. Right. Um, so, and we know the more we look that uh, because of the Wild West nature of, of, these, of these boards right. with no limits, these kinds of things need to be in a little. Is it time to look at putting limits on contributions? I know I keep pushing you. And, and, but, and I started with that idea. Oh, really? and, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look at that as a possibility. And can the but, state do that? Or would it oh, yes, the, the district, state could. The state could put, right, right now, um, because the state has not done it, the district can put it on themselves. And there are a number who have. Wow. I think Los Angeles County has, San Diego has, right. um, the San Diego Unified. Sure. Um, and, and then after this, um, one of the community college districts, Southwestern, um, I think, placed limits on themselves. At the same time, it's hard to raise money. I mean, let's face it. And so are yes. you strapping these individuals to the extent that they aren't able to raise money and get their message right. out? Right. And it's it's hard to raise money. And then when you have some a, an incumbent who's in there and right. entrenched, they just keep getting reelected whether they're doing a good job or right. not. And you don't even have outside groups in that can come in and give them money to, you know. And, right. and so it is. It's a balance. But this is a good first step. And um, the district attorney has said this goes to the root of uh, what happened in those indictments. Sure. Her name is Lorena Gonzalez. She is a member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Palmers. Thanks for watching California Edition.